Hi, my name is Van Partible, and I am the creator of Johnny Bravo. Yeah, he's basically me, but uh, more Filipino. I hope you enjoy 107 facts you should know about Johnny Bravo. When Cartoon Network was still new, one of the boldest characters it had to offer was Johnny Bravo, the Elvis-like smooth talker who wasn't as smooth as he thought. Premiering in 1997, Johnny Bravo is still an icon today and being smacked by women in reruns. So get your best Johnny pose ready, because this is 107 facts about Johnny Bravo. Let's get started! <laughs> Johnny Bravo was one of Cartoon Network's first original series, along with Cow and Chicken, Dexter's Laboratory, and the Powerpuff Girls. The concept for Johnny Bravo came from creator Van Partible's senior thesis in college. It was originally called The Three Elvis, and was about three Elvis impersonators who fought crime. The Three Elvis then became what was known as the Meso Blues, and instead featured an aging Elvis impersonator. Partible loved cartoons ever since he was little, collecting tons of Marvel and DC comics, as well as going to Disneyland every year with his family. When it came to animating Johnny Bravo, Partible sought to recreate the feel and look of old Hanna-Barbera cartoons in his own work. Partible's professor at Loyola Marymount University, Dan McLaughlin, enjoyed Meso Blues so much that he showed it to a friend working at Hanna-Barbera Studios. It was well received by the studio, and they urged Partible to pitch it to Cartoon Network. Joe Barbera took a special interest in the show and served as a mentor to Partible by sitting in on development and helping by answering questions and creating jokes. Partible took his original character from Meso Blues and changed him to be more of a James inspired character who speaks like Elvis. When Partible pitched his show, all the women in the room laughed while the men almost turned down the idea completely. Goes to show that the iconic womanizer was in fact a lady killer. Meso Blues has never been released to the public in full, but a few clips can be found on the extras of Johnny Bravo Season 1 in a short documentary called Bringing Up Johnny Bravo. The name Johnny Bravo was inspired by an episode of The Brady Bunch, where Greg Brady was nicknamed the next Johnny Bravo. Partible also stated that he drew influence from his own middle name, Giovanni, which is a translation of Johnny in Italian. Johnny's iconic blonde pompadour was inspired by Brad Pitt's hair in the film Johnny Suede. Partible reached out to Ed Benedict, a longtime animator at Hanna-Barbera, when trying to recreate the iconic look for his show. Partible didn't think there was any way Benedict would come out of retirement to help, and was surprised when he agreed to meet with him. Benedict agreed to do some concept designs for Johnny Bravo, as long as he had no deadline. He also explained to Partible that he wasn't doing it for the money, because he didn't need it. Partible took that to me that Benedict did it for their camaraderie and was grateful. He described the arrival of every piece of Benedict's artwork being like getting a Christmas present in the mail. In concept art of Johnny, it's noted that Johnny likes to stick out his butt and his chest. The artists were instructed to do so whenever possible. Yes, sir. There is concept art of Bunny Bravo without her glasses, but in the end, she, like Johnny, is never seen without her tinted shades, like mother like son. Much of Johnny Bravo's character was influenced by the late Elvis Presley, but Partible also took the liberty of naming the city in which Johnny lives Aaron City, after the king's middle name. Many of his catchphrases were also similar to things Elvis said, such as Bravo's lines, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, whoa mama, and hey there little mama. A fictional character who inspired part of Johnny Bravo is Danny Zuko from Greece. Partible wrote in his blog that Johnny carries the torch with his stereotypical macho personality, which overshadows the fact that at their core, they're both loyal and good-natured. Many of Johnny's animated movements were inspired by Michael Jackson's dance moves. Now that's one smooth criminal. I mean, character. Partible knew that despite Johnny's eccentric personality, he was still a relatable character, and people would would be able to see traits and characteristics in Johnny of people they knew. Partible explained Johnny's familiarity further, saying, People know this character because they have uncles, cousins, friends who act like Johnny Bravo. It's fun to watch even though he's kind of a narcissist. In an interview, Partible described Johnny as a guy who doesn't get it. He's kind of sleazy, but he has a good heart and listens to his mom. Aww. Since Elvis was very devoted to taking care of his mother when he was alive, Partible wanted to create that same parallel with Johnny and his mother, so he made them very close in the show. And Bunny Bravo often babies him. Partible explained that it was good for Johnny to be surrounded by females in the show so they could help humanize him and teach this over-the-top character how to behave, although it rarely stuck. Little Susie was created with the idea that Johnny needed a lady in his life that he couldn't possibly try to seek out romantically. Partible loved the idea of having such a young girl be Johnny's intellectual equal and friend. Johnny isn't the type of guy to try and hit on girls at a bar or any place that a normal adult would think of. He would try at random places, like a birthday party. 
This gave the character depth and made the show that much funnier for kids and adults alike. Butch Hartman, who you may know as the Fairly Odd Parents and Danny Phantom creator, was also a writer and director for Johnny Bravo. Hartman and Partible explained that when creating the show, nobody was too concerned about some of the adult humor that made it into the episodes. Cartoon Network was still pretty new at the time and didn't have too many viewers yet, so the network was pretty lenient. Johnny Bravo's pilot first aired on Cartoon Network's What a Cartoon Shorts program in 1995 through Hanna-Barbera Animation Studios. While Partible was working on the pilot, he happened to share an office with Craig McCracken, the creator of Powerpuff Girls, Paul Rudish, a designer for Powerpuff Girls, and Gendy Tartakovsky, the creator of Dexter's Lab and Samurai Jack. In addition to Butch Hartman, another awesome creative was also working alongside Partible on Johnny Bravo. It was Seth MacFarlane, who is the creator of Family Guy, just in case you haven't been paying attention to life. Mr. Barbera himself acted as a writing consultant for six weeks during the show's development. However, no one was aware that the network was being charged to have Joe Barbera involved in the meetings. Seeing there was no such budget, they had to let Joe Barbera go. What made Jeff Bennett, the voice of Johnny Bravo, stand out when he auditioned was that he added to the character. He ad-libbed Johnny's karate chop sound effects mid-sentence and was hired after that. Mae Whitman, the voice of Katara from Avatar The Last Airbender, started working as the voice actress for Little Susie when she was just five years old. Johnny's catchphrase of Whoa Mama not only stuck with the character, but also with the kids who fell in love with the show as well, who would sometimes quote him. Partible explained that one of the most challenging parts of any cartoon is finding writers who can write funny. He was fortunate enough to find a hilarious group of writers that made him laugh out loud during every single episode he watched. One of the comedic devices used was having Johnny often break the fourth wall and speak to the viewers in several episodes of the show. A staple in the show is how Johnny gets beat up in increasingly bizarre ways by different women in every episode of the show. The first season of Johnny Bravo was animated in-house at Hanna-Barbera Studios by Partible and his small team using digital ink and paint. Partible took inspiration for animation in-betweens from a show called The Dover Boys by Warner Brothers, where scenes would blur or smear to get from one frame to the other. It helped him save not only time, but money in the end. Johnny Bravo officially premiered on Cartoon Network in 1997. The show ran for five seasons, had two holiday specials, and concluded in 2004. Cartoon Network did not initially renew the show after the first season due to low ratings, but the series was then reworked without Partible. For seasons two and three, Kirk Tingblad took over as director. During seasons two and three, rather than writing scripts, the writers would outline the episodes in a room and write down all the important beats and jokes. They would then have the storyboard artists draw out rough sketches and post-it notes to help cut down on time and miscommunication. This method is still used today for cartoons like Regular Show and SpongeBob SquarePants. Eventually, Linda Semensky and Kaki Jones at Cartoon Network wanted to bring Partible back in to help work on the Johnny Bravo Christmas special. Partible said that the Christmas episode marked his return to the show. Some fans noticed the changes that the show went through in humor. The first and last seasons, as well as the pilot, concentrated more on his mature humor. He was more socially lacking and somewhat of a loser, while seasons two, three, and four were more slapstick for the younger audience. Once Partible was involved with Johnny Bravo again, the first thing he did was redesign the characters. Ed Benedict even commented that the body design of first season Johnny didn't make sense, so Partible and Von Tata, a member of the animation team, did their best to redesign Johnny in a way that felt right. After the Christmas episode, Partible then pitched a Valentine's Day special. In this episode, Johnny gets the best gift ever, the perfect date. Did you know that Johnny Bravo's birthday happens to fall on February 14th? Well, that certainly explains a lot. Partible was born in the Philippines and in 2011 said that he hopes to see more Filipino content in international animation. So do we. So when Partible returned to work on Johnny Bravo for its fifth season, he tried to hire as many Filipino talents as he could. He mentioned hiring four people, one of which happened to be singer slash voice actress Leia Salonga, who you might have heard from Disney's Pocahontas. Inspired by the style from the 60s and 70s, the studio brought in many guests to do cameos on the show, including Adam West, Donny Osmond, and the entire crew from Scooby. These guest stars were part of Johnny Bravo's side plots known as Johnny Bravo Meets, inspired by when Scooby-Doo and company would meet real-life actors or cross over with other cartoon characters from their time. In the first season, Johnny meets the characters of Scooby-Doo in Johnny Dooby-Doo. He ends up switching glasses with Velma at one point, before Daphne turns him down. Jinkies! Who could have seen that coming? Partible and McFarlane got permission from Cartoon Network Studios to take the real-life mystery machine out for a visit to Mae Whitman's elementary class. A police car followed them into the school parking lot, and a nervous Partible asked if anything was wrong, but the officer just wanted to know if Shaggy was in the back. In the episode Adam West Datorama, Johnny goes on a date with Black Widow. No, not the former assassin turned agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., but the old Hanna-Barbera cartoon character from Space Ghost. She's a badass in her own right, and doesn't put up with Johnny's attitude. Partible, like most boys growing up in the 70s, 
had a crush on Farrah Fawcett. After finding out she was doing voice work, he wrote her a nice letter and sent her a script in hopes of having her on his show. And guess what? She said yes! Fawcett appeared in the episode Johnny Bravo Meets Farrah Fawcett, where she shows up to her cousin Little Susie's birthday party to work the kissing booth, and Johnny makes a fool of himself. As usual, Fawcett said that the main reason she ended up doing the episode was because the script won her over. Props to the writers. As stated by Johnny in the episode, Farrah is the only person in the world to have hair as luxurious as his. We agree, Johnny. We agree. Being such a big fan of the show Freaks and Geeks, Partable was able to contact and get Sam Levine and Tom Wilson to do voiceovers for the show. Sam was in the episode Back from the Future as Clangor. Both did commentaries on their characters for the DVD release. Other guest cameos included Jessica Biel, Alec Baldwin, Weird Al Yankovic, Shaquille O'Neal, Luke Perry, Seth Green, and loads more. In the fifth season of Johnny Bravo, Jimmy Jameson sings Eye of the Tiger in the training montage parody for an episode. This episode had Johnny training with Mr. T and was titled T is for Trouble. Other musical guests included Sebastian Bach, Chuck D from Public Enemy, Billy Vera and the Beaters, Rick Springfield, and more. One episode parodied Grease and several 80s teen films. The show managed to hire Vince Clark of Depeche Mode to help craft the soundtrack in order to make it sound more authentic to the time period. Once specific reference to a famous movie is when Johnny has a run-in with a bear and says, Here's Johnny! Which, if you didn't guess by now, is referring to Jack Nicholson's line in The Shining. Johnny Bravo also lovingly parodied shows and movies, including Mary Poppins, The Twilight Zone, and It's a Good Life. At the end of the Christmas special, Johnny accidentally knocks out Santa and receives a pair of boxing gloves. This pays off when Santa knocks Johnny out with boxing gloves the next time he sees him. Guess he was on the naughty list that year. Johnny wasn't always a macho man. It was revealed in an episode that Johnny was once what Partable referred to as a 98-pound weakling. The episode where Johnny learns how to try and woo women from the sensitive male took much of its inspiration from Schoolhouse Rock. An episode that never made it to air involved a storyline where Mama gets addicted to gambling in Las Vegas. The network didn't necessarily approve of said addictions being referenced in their show, so the idea was cut off completely. Another episode that didn't make it to production was written by Seth MacFarlane. The story focused on Johnny saving little Susie's life and Susie devoting herself to serving him as a gesture of gratitude. In order to shake Susie off, Johnny places himself in dangerous situations so he would be the one needing Susie's rescue and making their debts even. Although the script was cute, it was scrapped. While many fans believe that Johnny is somewhere in his early 20s, his age is never officially mentioned anywhere in the show. As far as maturity though, he still has a long way to go. There is a fan theory that suggests Johnny is actually an 8-year-old boy, the same age as little Susie. All of those grandiose things that happen to him daily are a part of his wild imagination. You can check out Channel Frederator's video on that afterward. According to Johnny in Stump the Stump, the four main food groups are fruit, dairy, beef jerky, and most importantly, garden hose. Not sure if I would stick to that dietary routine. Johnny can play music from his nose, a man of many strange talents it seems. This can be seen in the episode The Hansel and Greta Witch Project. As seen in Lone Star Bravo, Johnny is distantly related to such historical and parodied figures as Benedict Arnold, Bravo, and Vaco da Gama, Bravo. In the episode Johnny Johnny goes to Hollywood, Johnny reads a script in which Partible's name is included, prompting Johnny to ask, is that even a word? Speaking of words, did you know that Johnny Bravo is now an adjective? Since the show's height of popularity in the 90s, people in India have used the term Johnny Bravo to describe someone who acts or appears similar to the character of Johnny Bravo. I'm not sure if that's a compliment or not. The staff believes that Johnny Bravo was able to resonate with children so well due to his big, harmless, goofball nature, and for how much he loves his mama. However, they believe that Bravo also connected with adults because of the 60s and 70s nostalgia that he brings through his old-style animation and Elvis-like character. Jeff Bennett was nominated for an Annie Award in 1997 for his voice acting performance playing Johnny Bravo. IDW Publishing released a run of Johnny Bravo comics in 2013 when they signed a deal with Cartoon Network to create comics based on their original properties. The comics, titled Super Secret Crisis War, featured iconic Cartoon Network superheroes and villains battling one another in different dimensions. Johnny is featured in a few panels of one issue from his point of view. The comic was illustrated by Erica Henderson and Derek Charm. They brought our Johnny back to life, capturing his iconic style and trademark moves, breathing new life into the past. Johnny Bravo was even the star of his own video game. The game was titled Johnny Bravo in the Haka Mega Mighty Ultra Extreme Datarama. Has a nice ring to it. The game was released for Nintendo DS and exclusively for the PlayStation 2 in Australia and Europe. The idea behind the game is that as Johnny, you compete against other various hunks to win the heart of the supposed date of your dreams on the Hukka Mega Mighty Ultra Extreme Datorama Show. Towards the end of the series, Johnny had a spin-off show titled JBBO, 
where Johnny would answer fan mail sent through email, letter, or phone call. In 2005, the Atlanta Braves wanted Johnny Bravo to be their mascot. Unfortunately, the Major League Baseball told them that they had to own the rights in order to do so. So instead, Johnny was made the mascot of Tuner Field, which is the Cartoon Network-themed play area outside of Turner Field. However, just so there was no hard feelings, Hartable drew a 14 by 18 sketch of Johnny in an Atlanta Braves jersey as a gift and gave it to the Braves. Nice. In October of 2002, a movie poster sporting Dwayne The Rock Johnson as Johnny Bravo started circulating online. While the poster itself was fake, the news was not. The Rock contacted Van about making a movie out of Johnny Bravo, and the two actually met to discuss. An early but full draft of the script was completed before the project unfortunately ended up in the development hell. If the film was made today, Van's current pick for the title role is Channing Tatum. Yeah, I see it. In 2005, Kyle Busch had Johnny Bravo painted on his Kellogg's Chevrolet that he drove in the NASCAR Sharpie 500 race, proving that Johnny does have some moves. Hey, I said some. Partable wrote and produced an 11-minute episode of Johnny Bravo, titled Johnny Goes to Bollywood. It was made only for Indian audiences and was only voiced cast and recorded in Hindi. Partable was the only American to work on the production. In 2009, Johnny Bravo had a 78-minute movie with the same name of Johnny Goes to Bollywood. The movie was made in collaboration with Cartoon Network Asia and was successful enough to lead to a spin-off show that only premiered in Asia. Johnny Goes to Bollywood earned a nomination at the Annecy International Animation Film Festival. That same year, it was the first nomination for an award that the show had ever received. That was also the year that IGN ranked Johnny Bravo number 71 out of 100 in its list of top 100 animated series. It seems that Johnny will date anything with a pulse, he even goes out with an antelope named Carol in the episode Date with an Antelope. It's a pity things didn't work out. They could have eloped. While the show was aimed for children, many fans believed that Johnny Bravo did at times challenge patriarchal views of how certain men view women. In Which A Woman, Johnny gets transformed into a woman named Jenny. Some viewers see this as one of the most feminist episodes of the series, seeing as how Johnny had to learn what it was like to be a woman. Another fan theory that is not uncommon in many shows nowadays is the prediction of 9-11. In one episode, Johnny and his friend Carl go to the movie theaters, and behind them is a poster of what looks like it could be the World Trade Center on fire with a sign attached reading, coming soon. Many fans felt that Johnny Bravo was predicting the 9-11 attacks. However, there is clearly only one tower in the fake movie poster, which could be any random building. There is nothing to clearly indicate that it is the World Trade Center. So sorry, you're not going to see it on Cartoon Conspiracy anytime soon. On the other hand, the show experienced some pretty bad timing with the episode Bootman, which first aired on September 11th, 2001. It featured Johnny as a superhero seemingly stopping a burning plane from crashing, but only to steal some peanuts before tossing the plane into a mountain. Due to the events of 9-11, the show was criticized for airing the episode. The full series run of Johnny Bravo has 65 TV episodes, two specials, and one made-for-TV movie. That's a whole lot of Bravo. Johnny Bravo still airs reruns of the show on Cartoon Network's sister station, Boomerang. Sweet. In the US, fans can buy season one on DVD. Once again, I'm Joe, and thanks for watching 107 Facts About Johnny Bravo. What's your favorite episode? Do you think it should be rebooted? Comment below and let us know. Don't forget to click the bell icon to become part of the notification squad. We have videos dropping every day, so make sure to subscribe to Channel Frederator, your Cartoon Central on the internet.